Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 548 of the podcast and it is Friday the 23rd of April 2021 as I record this. In today's show I'm talking to David Cadaby about how we need to make time for original insights that set our creative work apart and the importance of reframing productivity so it serves our career for the long term rather than just providing short-term cash. So that is coming up in the interview segment. In publishing news, Jane Friedman reports on her blog about how the pandemic is affecting book publishing, mainly focused on the USA, with lots of insights. So obviously book book sales (laughs) have shifted online during the pandemic, which tends to favour older or backlist titles and known favourites. The US has experienced 10 years of e-commerce growth in three months. (laughs) with books, music and video seeing some of the most dramatic shifts to online sales. This new environment makes it critical that publishers and authors adjust marketing and sales strategies and build new skill sets as these changes are likely to become permanent. And of course, that's what we're already doing as indies. Uh, From The article, The Seismic Change is in Digital. From now on, publishers must treat book selling as digital first, physical second, with no further questions asked. And of course, Jane notes that you won't find the New York Times discussing the fortunes of self-published authors, many of whom reported growing sales during the pandemic. And that is, of course, we are already digital first and well-placed for this shift to online sales of print, as well as ebook and audio. But I do think uh, probably the biggest thing we have to recognise as authors who have been digital first for some of us over a decade is that now traditional publishing is going to be muscling in on (laughs) on what we do. So definitely time to really consider what will happen as traditional publishing moves into the areas that indies have uh, sort of been owning, I think, for quite a while. And this brings me to a documentary we watched this week called Netflix versus the World. And this is a very, very good documentary in terms of of the longer term arc of how e-commerce has shifted and how um, formats have shifted as well. So essentially, it it charts how Netflix got started mailing out DVDs. And what was interesting is the two uh, sort of co-founders had considered doing a video mailing service but they had tested it using a um, tape (laughs) remember when we used tapes and they they tested it using the what VHS tape or whatever and they found that it just got destroyed in the mail by the mailing machine but when DVDs started to become popular they went right, this is the technology. And they tested it with posting a DVD. And of course, it worked. And so that's what they started. Uh, But they saw that selling DVDs was going to be a terrible model because Amazon was just starting. Again, this is uh, 90s. (laughs) It was 90s or early, must have been the 90s. And so they were selling them and they but they could see the end of that business. So this idea of seeing the end of a business model is really important to this this documentary. And uh, at, at one point, they actually went to Blockbuster and said, Blockbuster video, if you remember that, and said, uh, do you want to buy us? And Blockbuster turned them down. But later, Blockbuster started their own DVD mail out. And then again, Netflix saw the end of that model and started to invest in streaming, pivoting again. And what's interesting is how Netflix pivoted and pivoted and essentially cut off revenue streams that were 
a large chunk of their business in order to pivot to what they saw was the next step. And uh, I mentioned last week or the week before this book called Tarzan Economics, which is also this idea of swinging from one business model to the next. And at some point you have to let go of that old business model. And it's definitely a great documentary for considering how things shift over decades. And again, so many people focus on the short term, what's working right now, but we have to keep these decade long ideas in our head because of course (laughs) I am 46 and I want to be doing this hopefully for at least another 46 years (laughs) so I have to think in terms of these decade time frames and uh, so I think that's really interesting and Blockbuster couldn't pivot they actually changed the CEO change at the time again what's so interesting about documentaries on one hand you see how Netflix uh, pivoted and pivoted and changed and Blockbuster almost did but then one guy just didn't see the future and doubled down on the stores and that's what ended them basically and uh, whereas uh, Netflix bet on the internet and streaming but what's interesting right now is as as I record this in 2021 there are um, (laughs) there's been newspaper articles in the last week saying you know is this the end of the growth of Netflix but what's The other interesting thing is a lot of those articles are coming out of the US, but a lot of the growth now for Netflix is global. And again, this is what I've been saying for ages as ever, is that we have to look in the markets where digital is not the dominant, but the pandemic has really accelerated that. And on Netflix, you know, watching um, films like this last week, we watched a German film, Into the Beat, which was uh, cool. You know, I love uh, Call My Agent, which is 10% in in French on Netflix. That's just a great show. (laughs) Definitely watch that. It's about French uh, film and TV agents in Paris it'll make you want to go to Paris but this is um, what Netflix is doing is looking at the international growth because obviously you can't grow bigger than the the market that there is and in the US now for example you've got a lot more streaming services whereas the other markets not so much so again this pivoting towards what's next what's next that's what we've also got to look at Um, Yeah, so I think that's interesting. Talking of what might be coming next this week, the news of Joe Biden's antitrust nominee, Lena Khan, a law professor who has argued that companies like Amazon should be broken up or treated as public utilities. And this big tech backlash, which has been you know, started a couple of years ago, really, but is going definitely going to intensify with uh, some of the changes to come. And it is going to mean reform in these big companies. And definitely, even though we benefit from a lot of the companies, we, we have built a lot of businesses on the back of this. We also, I think, ethically, we can all say that we would like reform. It would be fairer to have reform. And uh, there are lots of issues with these companies too. So yes, consider what would happen if the status quo changes. And yet yeah, again, I really recommend that documentary, Netflix versus the world, because it gives you that 20 year perspective of how things change. And it also reminds you of what things used to be, you know, when you used to go, Jonathan and I, um, we were talking about when we were living, we were living in Ipswich, Australia, just outside Brisbane. And on our Friday night, you know, we used to go down to the video store (laughs) and pick up a pizza, which the pizza place was opposite the video store. And we used to get our videos and drive home with the pizza and the video. And now during the pandemic, of course, we're sitting at home and we can order pretty much any food we want on delivery and we can stream pretty much whatever we want on a multitude of options and that's just crazy and uh, when were we living there 2008 2009 so yeah just over a decade ago Another aspect of backlash against big tech this week, with a letter by 150 musicians, including Paul McCartney, Kate Bush, Sting and a lot of younger artists as well, calling for the UK government to reform the way musicians are paid for streaming, as it's a lot less than how much they are paid for radio. So this is really interesting because the letter says, as reported in the BBC, the letter says that copyright legislation has not kept up to date with technological change. And this is definitely pertinent for authors uh, as well and may soon be true for streaming of audiobooks and is I think already true for subscription models so 
if you are traditionally published and you have signed a contract and your ebooks and or audiobooks are being put into subscription services like KU or Scribd or Storytel and you don't have a clause for screaming for screaming <laughs> for streaming or subscription then how are you being paid for that because most traditional publishing uh, contracts will contain royalty payments by the format. And if your contract does not have a clause for streaming or subscription, there are two things that could possibly be happening. One, you're missing out on streaming or subscription for ebooks and audiobooks. Or two, they are being used, your publisher is doing it, and you're either not getting paid for it or you're getting paid something that is not in your contract. So that is a question for you if you are traditionally publishing. What does it say in your contract about subscription or streaming for ebooks and audiobooks? It also brings to mind those of us who are uh, independent, but is streaming, uh, are streaming and subscription models going to change the payments system? So there was an article on Pitchfork uh, about is there a fairer way for streaming services to pay artists? And again, this the music industry is always ahead. Uh, remember the interview I did with Tristra New Year Yeager uh, a couple of months ago now. And they, the music industry is questioning the payout based on putting all the money in a pot and then dividing it by streams. And of course, this is exactly what KU and a load of the ebook subscription models, that's what they do. So this is being questioned by the music industry. So it says, this article on Pitchfork, the standard streaming model puts all the payout in one pool and divides it amongst artists by share of total streams, like the page reads, for example. But Deezer, and there was also, Deezer is trialling a new system where essentially it's divided by by this new user-centric model. So for example, <laughs> most of us listen to the same music over and over again, like we really like a certain artist or we have a, a certain number of artists that we listen to. So let's say 25% of the music I listen to in a month is Bon Jovi. <laughs> then Bon Jovi should get 25% of my Spotify payment that month instead of just uh, streaming divided by the whole pool, for example. So yes, Deezer is trialling this for music and a Spotify study in Finland showed that it did go some way to redressing the balance where at the moment these bigger artists get paid more. So the, the lion's share of the revenue go to a very small number of people. And again, this is very true in books as well. Plus, they've also found it stops click fraud. Again, very relevant for us as online bots and fans and probably musicians and or authors try to game the system. But the argument against it is how complicated it is. Although something like uh, moving to blockchain systems could actually make this work. So yes, I, I was very interested in this because again, subscription and streaming has kind of crept up and crept up and crept up on us and is now almost mainstream in so many ways, but we haven't had a question so far as to how the payments are made. So this is very interesting. What would the fairest thing be for creators and rights holders? So yeah, I hope it makes it fairer and also stops fraud. That would be really, really good. <laughs> but yeah, just thought I would share that. In my personal update this week, the weather here is warming up. I mean, seriously, it's just got very lovely and we are moving out of lockdown as well we're in this sort of next phase so we're actually going out for dinner tomorrow night you're only allowed to sit outside so we'll be outside and of course wearing our masks to sit down and everything and uh, but I'm I'm super excited because we haven't actually been out for a meal for <laughs> for five months or something crazy but you, you it, it's so funny with this pandemic how excited we get about things we used to take for granted <laughs> I'm also getting into serious training for my next ultra marathon now it's warmer <laughs> and my next ultra is actually a double ultra it is the 100k 50k back to back uh, on a Saturday and Sunday in July uh, I am trying the race to the stones again those of you who've been listening for a while know that I did it in 2016 
But uh, I came in after the cutoff time. I came in weeping in pain because at the time I did not really know how to look after my feet on these longer walks. But I am much better at it now. I'm also a lot fitter. I've been doing a lot of weights. Um, and so I'm going to do it again in the, and I swore I would never do another one, but you know, I keep doing this. I think it's actually a hobby of mine now as a type A goal driven person, not just to go walking, but to do <laughs> ultra marathons. But yes, this week I did uh, 37k on a gorgeous day and I walked from Devizes back to Bath along the canal path. I'm very slowly doing different segments of the Kennet and Avon Canal and putting all the pictures on my books and travel blog. So I will uh, link to that in the show notes. And reflecting on David's interview today, which is uh, coming up, I do find that this the longer distance walking, so anything over about 20 kilometres, is a really good way to not think and just let my brain do what it do what it does. And I do find I don't really think on these days. I might have some days I have a couple of notes that I dictate along the way, but mostly I just find myself in a sort of meditative state. And it's impossible for me to do that in my house. (laughs) The biggest issue with working from home, I'm sure you all know by now, is that it's very difficult to separate work and relaxing time. So for me, unplanned time means generally getting out of the house and walking. So yeah, I think having some goals for this summer is really important actually having some things that are going to go on uh doesn't look like any traveling is happening so i'll be staycationing as in uh, just traveling within my area in the uk pretty much and uh, the walk isn't far from me it is the race to the stones is is a race to you it's not really a race i mean you do have to do it by cutoff time but i'm not racing (laughs) uh the it's to avebury the standing stones which are just uh very ancient stones that are very cool So I'm looking forward to that. And I have lots of training to do before then. In terms of my writing, I am researching and working on the shadow book. And a couple of people have emailed me to say, what is this shadow book? Is it fiction? Is it (laughs) nonfiction? So yes, it is. It is nonfiction. And it's based on the idea of the shadow ball by the psychologist Carl Jung. The side of our personality that we don't like to recognise, but that we all have. Yes, we all have that shadow side and it has influence over our lives. And if we don't recognise it, it can have an influence that we might not necessarily want. But it's not like a dark side, like an evil twin. So obviously, I write about murder in my books, and I have um, antagonists who want to destroy lots of things and kill people. But that's not my dark side. (laughs) So it's more the things that we push into the shadow because they're not acceptable in our family, our religion, our culture, our community, and uh, many of these different things that we essentially, when we're told, don't do that, you're not allowed to do that, you can't be that. And accepting a lot of uh, the things we put into the shadow can really help us live our best life as such and recognize some of our some of the things that might be holding us back there is gold in the shadow so from a creative side and a sort of self-help self-development side it's it's important and I'm discovering a lot about myself in this process which is very very interesting and I've spent a lot of time doing this type of analysis over the years but I'm even by writing this book I'm discovering a lot and perhaps that's why I've resisted it for so long But uh, and of course, I will have a chapter on evil, like true evil. But my aim with the book is to help you discover more about yourself that you can use to write more and write deeper and put more of yourself into your art, but also create better characters. Because one of the biggest issues with characters is that they can be one dimensional or, you know, most people, uh, if you're Per, you know, most characters, in fact, are not truly evil, the embodiment of evil. Um, you know, they're, usually it is nuanced. And I think these aspects of the shadow can help you and me write better characters in our fiction. And if you write nonfiction, can help you write better nonfiction because you can be more honest about yourself. So, yeah, I did identify this week, actually, that I have some imposter syndrome around this book because a lot of the books I'm reading for research are written by uh, Jungian psychologists. And I was like, oh, maybe I need a degree in 
Jungian psychology, maybe I need a degree in shadow work, which is a thing. And then I remembered that I actually have a degree. <laughs> my theology degree, I did my thesis on the psychology of religion, which Carl Jung was a really big part. I also did a graduate diploma in psychology and as I was going to retrain as a clinical psychologist. Uh, but I didn't go ahead with that. I just write a lot about it in my novels and my main character Morgan Sierra actually is a psychologist she was in the military she's a military psychologist and so I get to bring it into my books a lot so I'm trying to push aside that imposter syndrome and just write it as my usual non-fiction style sharing honestly and uh, doing a lot of research which is fascinating so I hope you're managing your time at the moment and able to research and write so thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. Marion said, I listened to this episode earlier today. Mark has always, so this was with Mark Leslie Lefebvre on Wide for the Win. And Mark has always presented solid information over the years about how indie authors should consider going wide. His knowledge and vast experience is much needed in the indie author space. Good podcast. Thanks, Marion. Bobby says, thank you for this podcast. I needed it very badly. And that was the only comment, Bobby, but I hope you're okay. <laughs> but yes, I'm glad it helped. HD Coulter sent a lovely picture of the blue sky and trees listening while enjoying a walk in the sun in Perth, Scotland. Oh, and Beth Ball says, I know it's a way out, but I am so excited for the shadow book. Thank you, Beth. And I would totally love to read The Relaxed Author if Joanna and Mark decide to make it a thing. I have actually been thinking about that and I wonder whether it is just a blog post or a podcast episode. But I I I do think the relaxed author is something we need to consider because there's so much hamster wheel production going on. Uh Kerry says, um sent a lovely picture of cherry blossom view from today's pandemic podcast walk in Copenhagen. Thanks for the wide for the win wisdom. Thank you, Kerry. And of course, you can always leave a comment on the podcast. You can tweet me at The Creative Pen. You can email me, joanna, at thecreativepen.com with your comments for the podcast. And I do get lots um, and I do always choose a couple to read out. If you have one that is private, just if you, and you email me, just say, please don't share this. <laughs> So today's show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons whose support is one of the main reasons I am still podcasting after almost 12 years. Whenever I think I might have said enough, <laughs> my patrons keep me infused and help me realise that this show is still useful, even though there are so many shows now uh, that it's still a good idea to carry on. So Thanks to new and returning patrons in the last week, Merrin Glover, Kai Kisser, Kerry Bloomfield and Elsa L. Kendall. Thank you to everyone supporting the show on Patreon, especially those of you who have supported for years now. You are amazing. You can support the show with just a few dollars or euros or pounds or Canadian dollars a month, less than a coffee a month or a couple of coffees if you're feeling generous. You get to ask your questions and I answer them on the monthly Q&A, which went out in the last week. You can support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. David Cadavy is a creative entrepreneur, non-fiction author and podcaster. His latest book is Mind Management, Not Time Management. Welcome back to the show, David. Joanna, thank you so much for having me back. It's good to be here. Yes, absolutely. Now, you were last on the show in 2018, so we won't get into your history. People can go listen to that. But let's get straight into the book, as this is so important. So I wanted to, I was re I was reading it, and it was fascinating uh, to hear about you reaching the end of your tether with productivity hacks and getting things done and all those things. So tell us about that. How did you get to that? Because, you know, we're, we're all self-help people here, and, and that's sort of part of our life usually. So what happened that made you get to the end of your tether? Heather. Yeah, I was a getting things done early adopter, I guess, maybe 2003 or 2004. I was in a cubicle in Nebraska and trying to figure out how to handle my first job. And I was using GTD and it was helping me a lot. And that was fine as, as a designer, which I was pretty well trained at and, and decent at. But really, I reached the end of my tether, I guess, when I got my first book deal, which was in 2010. 
and I was writing my first book, Design for Hackers. And I had no experience really as a writer other than writing on my blog a little bit. I'm not somebody who enjoyed writing growing up. It's not, it wasn't in my DNA, but I signed this contract and I needed to write this book within six months. And I quickly found <laughs> that GTD wasn't really doing it for me because the thing about getting things done is it helps you get things done if you know what you're doing. But when it comes to creative work, you don't always know what it is that you're trying to get done. Uh, creative work can be random. These insights come to you and you don't know exactly when they're going to come. For me, it was 12 hours a day of banging my head against the wall. And I would suddenly have these 15 minute bursts of flow where suddenly I could write this entire chapter and it would just come out perfectly. And I said to myself, well, why can't I just sit down and do that 15 minutes of writing and get on with the rest of my day? Why do I have to sit and agonize and, and wait for that moment to come? And that's when I started trying to find some patterns and ways of working that would make that those creative bursts happen on command when I wanted them to. Everyone's like, yes, we want that. <laughs> I would like to do that. And it's funny because as you're talking now, I was just writing some notes there. Is I'm we're recording this in March 2021. I'm feeling pretty burned out by the pandemic. And I think probably everyone yeah. is. <laughs> we're like a year in. And uh, it feels like, as if on the one hand it's never going to end, and on the other hand, that it might end soon. And it's funny because what you're talking about here is exactly how I'm feeling at the moment, is that I can't get to that 15 minutes. I'm getting a lot done, but it's not what you would call creative work in that way. It's necessary work because you know, listeners know, there's more to being an author, professional author than just the writing, yeah. <laughs> far, far more. But it's very interesting. You're talking about that 15 minutes where you actually manage to create something, but the difficulty is getting to that. So let's talk through the steps of how do you get to that point? So, so where do we even start? I think I would start with this idea that uh, with the sort of the building blocks of creativity are what uh, creativity scientists call insights. And there are scientists uh, like John Cunyos and Mark Beeman who have observed the moment of insight in the brain. And they have found that it is a, uh, a neurologically distinct phenomenon that when somebody has sort of an aha moment when they're solving a creative problem, that looks different in the brain from solving a, a procedural problem. Because when you are having a creative insight, you're sort of connecting these disparate elements from different regions of the brain. And they're all suddenly talking to each other just for like a moment. It's like your brain is a racquetball court with these blue bouncy balls bouncing all over them. And every once in a while, some of them collide and then you have an insight. And that's like a, a, a good idea. Now contrast that from your typical sort of procedural work, stuff that you already know how to do where there's steps that you can follow. That's different. That's a little bit, I think of it like insights are like solving a maze where you have to go down all these different dead ends uh, before you can find the solution. And procedural work is a little bit like a jogging path. It's one step after another. And this is why my book is called Mind Management, Not Time Management, because our understanding of productivity is based on this idea that time is this commodity, this uh, thing that you can line up like blocks of frozen orange juice concentrate. And, uh, you know, one unit of time is the same as the next. And intuitively, we know that that's not true. But when we actually try to get things done, we, we do try to manage our, our time. And creative work, these insights, they're not an input. It, it, like you can't just put in a unit of time and, and get one of those insights out. It's not a direct one-to-one -one relationship. And time management is left over from the industrial age. It's left over from Frederick Taylor. It's kind of the birth 
uh, was kind of the inventor of time management, I would say, just sitting there with a stopwatch next to some guy who's stacking bricks and deciding exactly what movements need to happen in what order and how long each of those movements, movements should take to follow the steps to complete this task. And creative work doesn't happen that way. So first, we would start with that one building block of of the insight and having those uh, moments, uh, those aha moments. So we need to create space for those. Yeah, well, it's interesting. And I have kind of conflicting feelings on this because, first of all, I completely get what you're talking about in that these idea of insights are... It does sometimes it doesn't matter how many hours you work on something, you just can't figure out like what that character should be like or how that plot point should work. Or sometimes I know I'm just looking for a story and it doesn't come, it doesn't come. And I have a thing on my wall that says trust emergence, which I heard on I think Jonathan Fields podcast years ago. And it's that feeling that eventually an insight will come and I can't necessarily rush it. I just have to trust the idea that it will happen. But on the other hand, you know, we're professional writers, people listen, many people listening are part of the, okay, I need to sit down and write 500 words, a thousand words, 2000 words, because I'm a professional writer. And that is more like you're saying the stacking bricks approach. Mm -hmm. So how do we balance those moments of creative insight with actually getting the words on the page as such? Yeah. Yeah. It is helpful I, I go both ways myself of sometimes I think of myself as a bricklayer, just sit down and pump out words and trust that there's going to be some good stuff in there. And then other times I, I want to have maximum reverie where I just want to be able to lay back in my hammock and stare at the clouds a bit and just make myself bored until some great insight comes to me. And I think both of those things are useful. For me, it's it's more about my like my skill level. What's my skill level with the the problem that I'm trying to attack, and how big of an insight am I looking for? Like, if I'm looking for a new idea for a book, and I I write nonfiction books, I spend years on them. Sometimes, this book I, I came up with the idea eight years ago, or I guess it kind of started ten years ago when I was writing the the, the first book. And then I had the idea for that became this book something like 10 years ago or eight years ago. If I'm looking for an idea like that, that's like a big C creativity. And that's where I feel like I need more space. So I look at it, at it more with depending upon the skill level that I have with this problem and the size of the insight that I'm looking for. That's how I manage the amount of space that I feel like I need to make a creative insight happen. In fact, the idea for this book, Mind Management, Not Time Management, came to me during a thing that I like to do once in a while called a week of want. And I'll do it usually between big projects. I think it was, I was just done launching my first book. And I take a week and I just clear as much as I can from my schedule, which is hard to do, but clear as much as I can. And just try to spend that entire week just asking myself, what am I curious about? Um, what do I what do I want to explore? And uh, during that week, I wrote this blog post: mind management, not time management. And uh, from that blog post, a uh, couple of years later, a behavioral scientist named Dan Ariely uh, reached out to me, wanted to know if I wanted to collaborate on a productivity app based upon this sort of mind management idea. And we collaborated on that. Google ended up buying that app. And then I've also written a book now from that eight years later. And that is from clearing that week out there. Uh, you know, Bill Gates was famous for taking think weeks. He, he would take all these documents to a cabin and just sit and read. And that's where he ended up writing this, this memo, the Internet Tidal Wave, which really poised Microsoft to have uh, a good lead on their competitors in, in terms of taking advantage of, of the Internet. So... It depends upon the size of the idea that you're looking for, the amount of space that you need to to allow for that to emerge. 
Mm. I love that you call it uh, a week of want there. And, and I agree on Bill Gates and his reading week. And it's funny because you call, you, you call it uh, making room for unplanned time in the book. But actually, you have to plan the unplanned time. You have yeah. to, as you say, you have to clear your schedule. You also almost have to decide what you are going to do in that time. For example, are you going to, like Bill Gates does, take 10 books, I think, to a cabin and think about those books? And you still have to choose those books. Or you mention your hammer. I love a hammock. We used to have a hammock in Australia. I definitely relax uh-huh. in a hammock, although I'm generally asleep in a hammock, to be fair. <laughs> but it's funny because I feel like, and I, for me, I think now it's more long distance walking because that gives me, I feel like I'm doing something in inverted commas because I'm moving yes. and I'm healthy. Uh, and yet I can't actually do on a computer and I think a lot and I dictate a lot and then I'll write in the evenings. I'll, I'll write up my notes and think about my notes in the evenings. And that to me is a sort of way of planning unplanned time in a way that keeps you occupied. But what are, you, what are your tips for people? Like, how do they, how do you even justify it? I think most people listening, you know, many people will have a family, have kids. I mean, they might still be homeschooling that, you know, how do you weigh up the pros and cons and, and how do you arrange this? Or is even just a day good enough? I mean, a day is better than nothing. Google was famous for having this 20% time that their engineers would use the 20% of their time. They could, uh, they could spend on on whatever they 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 wanted to work on, regardless of what their manager wanted them to work on. So, and and, and this is a common thing. A lot of people do. They have like one day a week where they work on things that are a little bit higher higher level. I a week is great. I mean, you can go even further. You can have it a sabbatical. Like you, people take months off for for things sometimes, and that sort of thing allows you to. Just the more time that you can get, the more that that allows you to go down different disparate paths that, in my experience, it seems like you're going nowhere. But when you actually trust yourself to to go down those paths, eventually they converge. And that's where you find yourself in these places where you actually have something really unique. And so... I don't know if it's it's necessarily like the career strategy to have, but Sometimes as authors, we are writing randomness. I mean, we are writing randomness. We, no matter how good we are, what we do, there's going to be some luck involved and in whether or not we come up with something good that has is a stratis, stratospheric success. And some of us hedge and, and, and try to write for market and, and try to make sure that we're going to make this certain number of sales and expect the graph to go you know up and to the right but really ultimately i think it's good to leave something there for you to have these sort of small bets that are kind of wild ideas that are probably not going to become anything but that at least have a chance of being a stratospheric success because it seems like the more that you don't take risks uh, the more that you are looking for that graph going up and to the right, the the less you have the opportunity for those crazy breakthrough successes to happen. So I actually have less and less time to do those a whole week like that because I already have things that are successful, that are that are low hanging fruit that I know I can spend time on and and get somewhere with. But I think if you're looking for that for an idea that will define you as an author, I think the more space you can come up with, the better. And it doesn't even necessarily happen during the time that you have off. I mean, I've certainly noticed in the rare occasions that I've taken, say, a week vacation, or even if I go for a hike, or if I go get a massage, it's not during the vacation. It's not during the hike. It's not during the massage. Yes, I have ideas during those times, but oftentimes it just happens to be after that. And so this is an interesting thing about time. Um, we, we think of time as money a- a- until, until it comes to un- unused time. We feel like, oh, we need to kill time. If we're just laying back on our hammock, we feel like we're wasting it. And we think that money's different because if we save money, we can keep a nest egg and it will grow uh, interest. But I actually think of time in a similar way that if I save time and I leave it open, that sometime in the future, that will pay off in the form 
of uh, a better idea. And in fact, there's a, a study out of Harvard University where they looked at some knowledge workers and whether or not they had what was called time pressure. That's what the scientists call it. We could just call it being busy. Like you feel like you <laughs> don't have time hmm. to do the things that you need to do. And they found that those who were under time pressure did a lot less of the activities that lead to insights, things like brainstorming or sketching up ideas that where, where there's a less clear objective to those things. And their work ended up being rated less creative by, by their peers. And they didn't find this just on the days that these employees felt time pressure. They found it the next day and, and even the day after that. And in fact, throughout the course of a project, that time pressure, that feeling of stress has, uh, it appears to have effects that last for a, a while. When I talk to neuroscientist John Cunos on my podcast about the neuroscience of creativity, he was saying that it's very easy to get out of an insightful mind state, but it's very hard to get into it. And that's why I like something like a week or as, as much as I can keep myself from getting stressed out, <laughs> which is difficult to do these days. That's why I like to take a longer amount of time is because it allows you to get into that area that you would never get into otherwise. And, you know, when I do something like that, where I have a long block of time where I'm being more exploratory, I'm very careful to not do something that's going to stress, like to, that's going to stress me out if I can help it, because you can very quickly change that, that mental state and get pulled out of this mental state that it took you a really long time to get into. It's interesting, like you talking about the value, the value of time in, in inverted commas, uh, in that I, I took a longer walking trip and I had eight days. And by the end of it, I was disappointed because I hadn't had some massive insight. But a few weeks later, I ended up going into almost uh, uh, well, flow, a flow state. And I wrote two books in about four weeks and launched them. And I had some of the most insightful thinking I've had in a long time. And exactly. Did you, did you connect the two? Well, I did afterwards. And I talked about this on my other podcast, the books and travel podcast. I talk about pilgrimage and I couldn't, I couldn't realize it until a month later, two months later, when I was like, oh, it was by taking so much time out that I enabled my brain almost the resting time or the time in the subconscious area of my brain to get on with these other things. And, but the problem, it's so hard to appreciate that value when you would think, oh, well, if but that's eight days, I could write mm -hmm. 8,000 words or 50,000 words in mm -hmm. that time. But am I wasting time? And what if I don't have an insight? And so it's very, I understand people if they're doubtful that these things are important. But I, I want to come back on something you said, which you talked about writing a book that might define you as an author and the idea of success. And you talked about the, you know, the graph going up and to the right, which is a book sales or a money definition of success. But I also wonder if this pandemic has given people a wake up call about life is short and you need to write the books that might define you as an author, might define your life. So I wondered about you, like what have you found has changed in thinking about these things during this time? Have you come to any reconsiderations about your career or what you consider success? I haven't felt a big change during the pandemic. I don't want to spoil what's in the book because this is in the book, but like right before the pandemic, I had a couple of the worst experiences um, that were for me way worse than the pandemic has been so far. But so I had already done some evaluation in that way, but I, I do always try to, you know, have some amount of my resources that I invest in those sort of crazy, what they call asymmetric ideas. Like it doesn't take you, um, it doesn't take you a lot maybe to, to try these crazy ideas and the potential downside is relatively low, but the potential upside is really high. And this is one of the things that I have struggled with when it comes to like, so the, this idea of the graph going up and to the right is this idea of there being a steady 
sort of income that comes in and that each day you're making a little bit of progress on the previous day. Well, the, the problem with that is that's not really how creative work or creative success works. I'm personally very uh, influenced by the writing of Nicholas Nassim Taleb, who writes a lot about randomness. And he talks about these two worlds of mediocristan and extremistan. And so like mediocristan is this world where things are predictable and stable. And extremistan is this world where things are unpredictable and unstable. And as creatives, I really think that we work in extremistan. I mean, people will try to do the thing where they, you know, write the series, they write to market, and they make the they have the plan of how they're going to write 20 books and get to 50k, and and that that will make the graph go up and to the right in some reliable way. And I totally understand the motivation behind that. And that's something that I try to have some amount that I that I do because that's a way to bring stability to finding your way to success as an author and finding your way to these these ideas that are going to be that are going to differentiate you. Because let's face it, like writing to market, writing for, for KU, um, pumping out formulaic books is is ultimately not super secure because we got AI coming. Like they're probably going to be able to write books like that. You need to, the, the one thing, I think it's Neil Gaiman that said this, the one thing that you have that nobody else has is you, but you need to find what that is. And so you need the space to do that. So inspired by the, the writing of Nassim Taleb, I try to think of what's called a barbell strategy. And the, the way the barbell, I hope that this doesn't get too esoteric, but this is the way that I think uh, the barbell strategy, at least in an investing standpoint, is is that you would take 85% of your resources and you would put them in investments that are not going to lose money. And that's harder and harder to do with potential inflation. I'm, I'm not a financial advisor, but you know, things like gold and bonds and like things that aren't going to go down in value. And then the other 15% is these sort of wild card things that have unlimited potential upside. You know, you might have bought cryptocurrency or you might do some angel investments or uh, little things that you could lose that 15% of your portfolio, but that's all that you would lose. And if you made 15 bets out of that 15%, one of them might be explosive and go up a thousand uh, a thousand X. And so I try to think of my creative career the same way where I'm trying to create some kind of stability in part because having that stability helps you relax and relaxation is what brings about insights. And then I try to spend the rest of my resources on here's something that only I can do, or here's some idea that you know could be big, probably won't, could be big. And uh, it's not an up to the right, up and to the right graph. It's more like a I think of it like more like a poorly shaved porcupine that like every once in a while, there's just this explosive spike and you just make these small bets. So for myself, I've written hundreds and hundreds of blog posts since 2004 on my blog, Cadavy.net. I've only had two like big ones, what Nassim Taleb would call black swans. They're these, these events that happen that you, you can reverse rationalize them, but you don't really know why, why the success happened and it was it was a zero to one uh, thing. It, it was an explosive success. So for me, that was I wrote a blog post. I got my first book deal, and I wrote my first book, Design for Hackers. The other one was when I wrote My Management, Not Time Management, the blog post that came uh, during that week of one. It happened to happen during, I think, um, and that resulted in working on an app that sold to Google, and then also this book that I recently released my management, not time management. So that's the way I try to think of things is like, as best as I can, try to create some bit of stability. And then with the rest, play and tinker and, and take risks, uh, or at least risks that, that, that don't have a lot of downside, but that have a lot of potential upside and uh, let randomness take over.
Mm. I mean, I would say I have never had uh, any of those events happen. I've never had a, a spike like that. So I would also encourage the audience, you don't have to have a spike like that. You can just, as I have done since 2006, when I started writing, it hasn't always gone up and to the right. But if you focus on, you know, producing your best creative work, then over time you can make some kind of stability in terms of an income. And I've certainly had a stable income for the last decade since I left my job. But it, as you say, it's certainly not <laughs> that it, it, every time you launch a book, it goes up and to the right again. So it is it, interesting. It depends what you think is fun too, you know, I as long as you're having fun. And I, I just can't have fun unless I'm having those sort of things I put out there every once in a while that like Seth Godin would say, where I'm think, thinking to myself, this might not work. Absolutely. I, I do want to come to your experiments in self-publishing because you uh, have a mini book on your site, Failing to Succeed, which I think is also on Amazon as well. And you've tried lots of different things. As you said, you've uh, tried different ideas a- along the way. And you've also shared a bit about your author income and what's worked and what's not worked. So I wondered if there were a few key things that you've learned about best practices uh, uh, being an author, whether indie or traditional or, or hybrid. Yeah, I release an income report, a 5,000 word, extremely detailed income report on my blog every month. And it's an exercise in which I really discover a lot of things myself in the process of writing and reporting my thought process bit by bit and dissecting that. As far as like best practices, I, I know I like I, I've said a, a second ago that the like the KU thing that people write for KU and and put their books in KU. That's something that I've tried to avoid. I've tried to be wide, even though it makes no financial sense in the beginning, in part, not just because I kind of want to fight the good fight and give people a different choice besides besides just Amazon, but also because I think that like what KU is, is like Amazon's trying to turn you into a commodity. If you play into that game, that's naturally going to cause you to optimize your work in a way that makes it easy to turn into a commodity. And so that takes you away from being able to create something that only you can create. I think that that generally pushes you in that direction. Again, I understand the motivation. I understand that like, especially if, if this isn't your full-time job, like it's a great use of your resources to just do KU, don't even think about it and just, you know, get out of the cubicle first. But I think like, uh, trying a lot of different channels and uh, being patient with that investment is something that I encourage people to do if they have the resources to do that. I've been down the rabbit hole with Amazon ads and I've gone to the point where I'm spending like $6,000 in a month on Amazon ads to make $1,000 profit. So, you know, $7,000. And I'm to the point where now I just basically do the auto campaign (laughs) and I mess with the daily bid. And like, that's my 80 20 for that is just play with the bid. Um, I'm doing auto campaign. Amazon's got good algorithms for that sort of stuff. And let, you know, otherwise you can go down a, a, a very circuitous rabbit hole. I also think lock screen ads are really underrated. I see a lot of authors try lock screen ads one time and then they're just like, well, that didn't work. Because what they're doing is they're looking at the reporting in the dashboard for the lock screen ads. And a little secret, that reporting is wrong. (laughs) It will tell you that you made no sales on this lock screen ad that you got 100 clicks for. But weird, in your KDP dashboard, there's this... Uh, the sales have gone up as the impressions and clicks have gone up on this ad. Hmm, how did that happen? Uh, and I, I've looked at this a little clo- uh, a little bit uh, closer, and uh, I have to conclude that reporting is wrong. So I run lock screen ads quite a bit, which I probably shouldn't even tell the secret because <laughs> uh, you know now people now my bids are going to have to be higher. But there's the uh, mastering Amazon ads. Kindle book that that I found that helpful in the beginning, but I've also gone down the rabbit hole myself hmm. there with Amazon ads. So that's just a a, a, a couple things. I, I think also diversifying the income. If you can find 
any sort of affiliate programs that relate to your audience. I know it's difficult with fiction, I think, but that's a thing that I try to do to find that stability, that padding is I, I make a passive recurring revenue from referring people to Active Campaign, which is the the email marketing platform that I use. And that's a nice diversification. It's nice to know that there's at least one other income source besides Amazon that's substantial and, and mixing it up that way. So mm. I think just trying to not be dependent entirely upon Amazon is is one good way to go. Oh, for sure. And of course, I always talk about multiple streams of income on the show. Right, yeah. but you did. So you've mentioned like not being in KU and not focusing on Amazon, but you really gave two tips on Amazon ads did, and yes. Amazon marketing. So can you give us a, anything on the wide platforms or selling books outside of Amazon? What are you doing for that? Um, I, I have started selling direct using PayHip and, uh, and BookFunnel. Uh, one experiment that I did, and you can find my entire breakdown of this over on writingcooperative.com, was for this book, Mind Management, Not Time Management, I did what's called a preview edition. And what that was, was I set up a schedule and told my list, you got you to gotta have, you gotta have the email list, that's an important thing, that they could buy this preview edition. And basically, I released one chapter every few weeks of the draft and I delivered it to them via book funnel and they paid through PayHip for this preview edition. So I charged $20 for the preview edition, which was this early access to the draft. And people got to read this information before you know, months before anybody else. You know, this is maybe better for nonfiction. I think you could still do it with fiction too. And then there was also a Facebook group where people could discuss the content and then I also shared the Google Doc of the draft and allowed those people to read the draft and provide their feedback and comments. And so I made $4,000 uh, before I even released my book mm -hmm. through this preview edition. And that was through using PayHip and, and BookFunnel to just deliver. Uh, and, and also I created the eBooks in Vellum. Uh, I created the final eBook myself in, in Sigil. But uh, just to quickly create individual chapters as ebooks and deliver them as I was writing them, I used PayHip and, and BookFunnel and, and Vellum. I oh, know that's it's great to hear that. And I, I think that's the other thing that's circling back to what we're talking about. I sometimes get a lot of ideas for marketing or extra products or extra ways of using the intellectual property asset while I'm walking, while I'm doing that unplanned time. Or you might be listening to a podcast like this and get an idea and, and that might help you later on. And often it's coming up with new things like you're talking about there. That is, I think, this kind of direct sales is so brilliant. I mean, you've essentially made more like if you make like four grand like that's pretty much paid for the book you know a lot of people if they get a traditional publishing deal might only get five grand for the life of topic copyright so that's actually a really big deal <laughs> yeah and, and i didn't hire once again i didn't hire an editor my readers edited the book now i happen to have a few readers who were our actual editors who were excited enough to read my content that they edited the book and provided good feedback. And you also have, you know, you get some feedback that's not useful too, and you have to comb through that. But having that feedback from the readers, it was just great to have that support early on and to be able to focus on what I wanted to focus on, which was writing the book. And that's the ask that I make to, to the readers in that sort of situation is like, hey, I'm almost done with this book. I really want to focus on it. You are a supporter. And uh, you can read this content months before anybody else. It's going to be in draft form, but I would love to have your help. And there's no, it, it, the problem that there is with something like, say, Kickstarter is that one, you're bringing your own audience anyway. Uh, you're not going to like have your book go viral. You could have your book go viral on Kickstarter, but then you'd have a bunch of people who weren't already super fans mm. and, and they're going to want a deal. They're going to want to pay less than you're actually releasing the book for. And looking at the margins in publishing, like you can't really do that. So with me, my book is selling right now for $14.99 on, on Kindle. 
But the and I think it launched at nine ninety nine. I, I waited until it was on great on Kindle, and then I made it in fourteen ninety nine. And uh, but these people paid twenty dollars up up front, but they were getting it months in advance. They had interaction with me in the Facebook group, and uh, they were fine with it. That it was they were paying more than it was actually launched for. So you let your super fans support you. Mm. Right. Well, we are out of time. So where can people find you and your books and everything you do online? Sure. Thank you so much for having me again, Joanna. This has been fun. If you just go to kdv.co, really easy for you to type on your smartphone. Uh, you'll find my website there. You can find my monthly, uh, my weekly newsletter, Love Mondays. And you can find all my books everywhere, Amazon, uh, Google Play, all over the place. And you'll also find them over there at kdv.co. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, David. That was great. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed the interview with David today. And if it challenged you in any way, then perhaps you could turn that into action by scheduling some unplanned time off to think or read or walk and consider your longer term body of creative work. On next week's show, I'm talking to Nadine Mutas about translation and how it plays such a big part in her author business. Lots of tips if you're thinking of branching out into other languages. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.